Welcome to Carb Nation TV. Today we will be discussing trumping white black African Americans, MAGA, and the danger of racial authoritarianism. Our guest is Dr. Clarence Lucene, Professor of Political Science and Global Affairs at Howard University. Stay tuned. Today, Carib Nation is very pleased to have with us Dr. Clarence Lusain. He will be speaking to us today and we'll be having a discussion on a subject that is very important in America today and particularly with the elections of 2024 right in our front steps. The subject today is Trumping while Black, African Americans, MAGA, and the danger of racial authoritarianism. Without further ado, Dr. Lucey, uh, this subject, Trumping while Black, uh, I think you are working on a book, isn't that so? Uh, yeah, that's right. So I have been very interested in the topic of authoritarianism. Uh, and many people have accused Trump of being an authoritarian. Uh, both in terms of how he attempted to govern when he was in office, but also more broadly, the movement that he leads, uh, the MAGA movement, the Make America Great movement. Now, one of the things that stands out in that movement that I think hasn't gotten as much attention as it needs is that it is a multiracial movement. That although I think the core of it is a white supremacist, Christian nationalist kind of ideology, it has managed to get Black people, Asian people, Latinos to become part of that movement. And so what I've uh, been focusing on is looking at the dynamic of African Americans uh, in and around that movement. Is this because traditionally African Americans were considered in the progressive wing of American politics? and culture, and also have always struggled to have on the agenda in the public square and the official square of America, both race and class, and equality, and justice, and civil rights, and human rights. Is that correct? Uh, so that's exactly right. The thrust of African Americans uh, in the U.S. from the time that people landed in 1619 to the present has been to fight for a broader, inclusive, democratic kind of society. And so that has been kind of the nature of Black politics in a broad uh, sense. But there always has been conservative elements within the Black community. Uh, but that spectrum uh, was so far. Uh, even many of those who consider themselves conservative uh, were within the realm of fighting for uh, Black rights and for African-American inclusion and for you know a broader society that would be democratic. What we see now, though, which is unique, is that it's not Black conservatives, Black extremists. And the MAGA movement is an extremist movement uh, that essentially calls for the overthrow of constitutional uh, and liberal democracy. And certainly that has been how Trump has talked about uh, society, but coming with all of that is a racial lens. But when Trump talks about uh, immigrants and when that movement talks about being against immigrants, they're not talking about immigrants from Canada or from France or from Germany. They're talking about immigrants of color coming from uh, Latin America, coming, coming from Asia, coming from Africa. Uh, so that's the tone of that uh, movement. And again, it would be it's surprising, I think, to many that you have a, a cohort of African-Americans who see themselves as aligned with that movement, are followers of Donald Trump, 
despite his long, long, long history of racial practices. So can you walk us through, uh, introduce us to some of these personalities who are identified, Black and Trumpite, identified with the MAGA movement? Walk us through. So there are a number of different categories. Uh, so if it, you, know, you would think that maybe there's just a few, but actually there's quite a number of them. Uh, they have organizations, for example. Uh, there are about six or seven major organizations uh, that emerge uh, that are Trump affiliated and Trump supporting. Uh, you have the National Black Republican Association. Uh, this existed before Trump ran for office. It had been around for a number of years and had earlier supported some of the far right uh, Republican candidates. But when Trump came along, it was one of the first groups to jump out and endorse him. Uh, and they've followed him ever since. You had a group called Black Americans to reelect the president. This was a group based out of uh, North Carolina. And they were putting ads out around the country trying to help uh, Republicans who supported Trump. You had Black Voices for Trump. This was a Trump campaign group that was created in the uh, summer of 2020 uh, when Trump was running for reelection. And they were trying to trying to come up with strategies to win the black vote. And so they created this group. Uh, they really didn't do much uh, because the uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic prevented people from really being out uh, campaigning and knocking on doors, which is what they were going to attempt uh, to do. Uh, there's another group called Black Voices with Trump, uh, which is a really, really fringe group. Uh, also, for some reason, out of Florida. Uh, and it's led by uh, some individuals who were tied to some cultist groups uh, a number of years ago. And you will see them often at Trump rallies. They have shirt, white shirts with black lettering that says uh, Blacks for Trump. Uh, Trump keeps a little bit of a distance from them because they are so kind of extreme, but he does like to have black faces somewhere in his crowd. Uh, so you would see them around. Uh, then you have most recently the Black Conservative Foundation. Uh, this was the group that Trump, Trump spoke at last week uh, where Trump talked about how he's always been a friend of Black people and Joe Biden is such a racist. And they have plans uh, to, uh, as they see it, uh, swamp the country, uh, particularly in swing states, uh, defending Donald Trump uh, for the election this year. And what is the other category group of, of folks? So there, there are folks who have more of a national profile who are in positions at the federal level. So starting with Clarence Thomas, of course, uh, who's the Supreme Court Justice. And uh, a number of cases that have come to the court where Clarence Thomas should have recruited himself uh, because of either his history with some of the individuals or because his wife was such a advocate and organizer for Donald Trump, uh, just out of just a conflict of interest. Uh, he should have recruited himself, but he hasn't. But he's been uh, pretty magnified. Uh, and he's one of the, um, in the main judge uh, that the mega move uh, counts on in terms of uh, cases that might go to the court. You also have a number of folks who've been elected to uh, Congress. Uh, Black Republicans, you have Tim Scott over in the U.S. Senate. Uh, he has been a Trump follower pretty much from day one. Uh, he kind of ran for president, but not really, and never really got any support and, you know, dropped out uh, and immediately uh, endorsed Trump. Uh, you also have By uh, Byron Donalds. Uh, he's a Republican Congress member. Uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, he's from Florida. Uh, he's only been in Congress two sessions, uh, but he's one of the biggest uh, Trump boosters uh, in the Congress. He's a member of the Freedom Caucus. I think he's the only Black member uh, of the Freedom Caucus, which is really the far, far, far right uh, of the far right uh, that's in Congress. Uh, you've got Burgess Owens, who's out of uh, Utah. You've got John James, who's uh, out of uh, Michigan. 
you got a number of folks who have a uh, pretty relative high profile, uh, at least at the federal level. And then when you look at the state, you have individuals like um, uh, Mark um, Robinson, who's uh, in North Carolina. And he, uh, I just can't even say how extreme he is. Uh, he's taking the position about reparations that actually black people owe reparations. Black people should pay reparations to somebody. Am I correct to understand that extreme rightists or uh, this kind of extremism really supports an ideology of white supremacy? They don't see that from their vantage point. But they, they are denying the fact that Donald Trump and his movement is principally being driven in terms of who votes for him, who supports him, where his funding is coming from, the policies that he's advocating, uh, all basically are within a white supremacist uh, Christian nationalist uh, framework. And in fact, they, one of the characteristics of what I call Black MAGA uh, is that they deny Trump's racism. So one of the key uh, leaders of Black MAGA is Reverend Daryl Scott. Uh, he was very visible during uh, Trump's first term. He's a preacher outside of Ohio. Uh, and he's, he spent a lot of time pulling together other uh, Black conservatives who support Trump. Uh, he did an interview where a reporter asked him about Trump's uh, years and years of going around saying that um, Barack Obama was not born in the United States. He was ineligible to be a president. Reverend Scott, now this is a minister, said he didn't have a problem with that. He didn't see it as racist. In fact, he thought it was smart politics because it got Trump some attention. So those are the kind of people we're dealing with. They just simply deny uh, what's pretty visible to uh, the rest of the world, that Trump has been uh, and will continue to be uh, one of the nation's most largest visible racists. So these are... Uh... African Americans who are Trumpites, uh, but particularly in the extremist uh, wing of Trumpism in terms of the MAGA movement and so forth. Um, yeah. These are strong individuals. Are they, is this a pursuit of individualism? Is this a pursuit of opportunities that they may not have in the Democratic Party? And because they are less, in the Republican Party and in the Trumpite movement, the MAGA movement, that they will have more opportunities for positions and to advance their own personal careers. And are there any examples of some of these? So there's a mix. So some of them uh, believe in the ideology that Trump says. They, they accept all of his kind of far right notions or far right notions of the MAGA movement, whether it's on abortion, whether it's on LGBTQ issues, whether it's on foreign policy, you know, on all those issues where there's kind of a far right position that Trump has staked himself out, uh, they actually believe it. So some of them are just aligned with Trump ideologically and politically, but there are others that clearly are careerists and opportunists. And they saw in Trump a avenue by which they can either monetize their politics uh, or be close enough to power where they could kind of benefit. So with o Omarosa, for example, uh, who was uh, on Trump's TV show, The Apprentice, uh, and developed a reputation as a very kind of ruthless and cutthroat uh, personality, she was the main African-American that Trump brought with him to the White House. She had a role as his advisor, it was kind of fuzzy, uh, but they had a falling out principally because she ran into conflict with other people in the White House. Uh, and they wanted to get rid of her. And then once she left, she, she turned on Trump, then Trump turned on her. Of course, it became very ugly, uh, and very nasty. Uh, you had people like Stacey Dash, who's an actress, uh, who also joined, uh, joined in with Trump. Uh, but then it turned out bad for her as well. So she's kind of dropped out and doesn't want to have anything to do with Trump or politics or anything else at all. Uh, you had Candace Owens, who was one of the most visible. Uh, she's still um, 
in the far right uh, kind of media uh, sphere. And uh, she's kind of fallen out with Trump uh, because she hasn't gotten, she didn't get what she thought she was going to get out of Trump. So she pretty much, you don't see her around some of the MAGA events uh, anymore. Uh, you have people like Alveda Al King, uh, Martin Luther King's niece. She's the daughter of one of King's brothers uh, who for decades, um, because of her far right politics on abortion and on some other issues, uh, she's been out there on that side. And then when Trump came along, it became transactional. She got to be around Trump. Trump got to be around somebody related to Martin Luther King. And so you see her, uh, she was in Black Voices for Trump. She's in the Black Conservative Federation. She's been at, she's with Trump at his Black History Month White House events. Uh, so you got individuals who have clearly seen an opportunity, as you point out, uh, of being around power, uh, but it always ends badly. Is this ship uh, towards, even though marginally, to the Republican Party from the Democratic Party, is it is the main push factor that, that the Democratic Party itself has fallen down over the years on the subject of equality and racial justice for people of color? particularly African-Americans? So that's the claim that uh, some of them make. So Candace Owen and uh, Kanye West, uh, Yee, had attempted to start a movement called Blexit, uh, which still kind of exists, even though it seems it mostly exists on the internet. Uh, but Blexit is, was taking up the theme that had happened in the UK. Uh, Brexit, when there was a move by conservatives there, to get out of the European Union. So they created Candace Owens and Kanye West created Blexit, which is their movement to get Black people to get out of the Democratic Party. Because they make that argument that the Democratic Party has been exploiting Black people, taking Black votes for granted, uh, hasn't delivered, uh, which is, of course is the same exact argument uh, that Donald Trump makes. Uh, and in that sense, they attack the civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter, kind of all of that. Now, it's hypocritical because Candace Owens, for example, uh, when she was in high school, she was being racially bullied and got it became so bad, she ended up going to the NAACP, which filed a case, which actually she won, and she got paid uh, a few thousand dollars or something like that. So she was kind of in that space. Uh, and even um, 2015, early 2015, before Trump announced, she was still on social media uh, talking about po Black uh, po uh, police brutality against African Americans. You know, she had some liberal kinds of issues. But then Trump comes along, he sees an opportunity, and she kind of dramatically shifts to these real kind of extremist uh, views. Uh, same thing with uh, Diamond and Silk, uh, these two sisters uh, who became favorites of Donald Trump. Uh, one of them passed away, Diamond, uh, last year. Uh, but during Trump's time in, in office, you would often see these two sisters, uh, and they were loved by far-right media. So they would be on Fox News, they would be on Newsmax, they would be on One America, uh, essentially kind of clowning uh, as they attack liberals, they attack Democrats, they attack uh, Biden, they attack Obama, you know, so forth. Uh, but again, shortly before Trump announced, they were doing uh, podcasts and media, uh, social media uh, work where they were saying police brutality is really an issue, Black people need social justice and kind of all of that. But again, they saw an opportunity with Trump. They jumped on it, and, and this is where they kind of landed. Very interesting. You know, um, Dr. Lusain, one's identity is often reinforced by one's links with one's community. And historically, I have known movements like the union I'm the historian of, the Black Union and National Alliance of Post and Federal Employees, that throughout their history, over 100 years, they have always reinforced 
uh, their cause, their identity, by identifying with issues in the Black community. Now, these folks that you have just reviewed, uh, when they go to the MAGA movement, the Trumpite movement, have they cut their links with the Black community? And how do they sustain their identity? Are they embraced by white nationalists? Well, so it's a mix. So uh, the, the ones that are organized, they very explicitly say they're operating to uh, further the Black community, that the Black community will move forward based on these kind of principles not the ones of the Democratic Party or NAACP or National Action Network, none of that progressive liberal stuff. It really is kind of a conservative uh, thrust. And so they will argue that that's what's going to free up uh, African Americans. But then you have a lot of them who come out of these white spaces, uh, and that's their bread and butter. And particularly, all those organizations are funded, by the way, by you know white conservative money. Uh, they're not getting money and support from the Black community uh, for the most part. But you have people like the candidates that I mentioned, like Byron Donalds and uh, James John and uh, uh, Wesley Hunt. All of those are uh, elected in majority white districts, overwhelmingly majority white districts. Uh, so they're representing uh, in the political sphere, a very conservative, very white uh, kind of constituents. So their, their political future, their political status is not tied to the Black community. It's tied to these white conservative communities. Can you speak to some of these personalities who have attempted to obtain office with uh, Trumpite support but failed? For example, there was a candidate out in Atlanta, I think. Who, Hersha Walker. Yes. Can you talk a bit of some of these folks and why is it from a political science perspective, that they, they, they failed to win uh, their position, that the offices they sought? Uh, so uh, some of them ran in uh, majority Black districts uh, in Detroit and Atlanta and a number of different places, and they lost uh, because the Black community has long established uh, histories uh, with Democratic Party uh, and are, are opposed to what they see as the agenda for the Republican Party. So, you know, that kind of went nowhere. Uh, so then you had others that ran in majority white districts against white candidates. And in many instances, the white candidates won uh, because they were reflected more of what, what people wanted, even though these black candidates uh, may also have had a very conservative uh, kind of perspective. Uh, but some of them still kind of around. So in Michigan, you had a woman named Katrina Caramo who ran uh, in 2022, I believe, uh, for Secretary of State. Uh, she has really extreme positions. She's into QAnon and conspiracies and some really kind of crazy stuff. Uh, she lost the uh, race. To this very day, she claims she never lost. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the next year, she was uh, elected to be chair of the Michigan uh, Republican Party. So from last February until uh, this February, just this past month, uh, she uh, ran the party, but she was very divisive. There was lots of conflict. Uh, so they voted to remove her uh, out of her place, out of her uh, position, she basically has refused to leave, so she still kind of claims that she's the chair. There's another person who claims that he's the chair, uh, but, you know, it's all kind of like uh, infighting uh, within the Republican Party. But she's African-American, uh, and she comes out of a little air, an area in Michigan uh, where there's very few Black people. Uh, and, you know, because she was so uh, Trumpified, uh, even though she lost her uh, political race, uh, they rewarded her by making her chair of the uh, party, even though she had no skills or talent or history to, to be in that position. It's basically conservative affirmative action. 
you know, Dr. Lusain, you are aware, as I am, that historically, since the time of Lincoln and so forth, uh, that African Americans were identified with the Republican Party until the time of um, uh, the after the Great Depression. Right. Uh, once Frederick Douglass said the Republican Party is the debt and everything else is the sea. Would you say for African Americans that the Democratic Party is the debt and all else is the sea today, or is it shaky? So you know when I when that issue comes up about you know Lincoln and black people, you know my position is the consensus among black people is always where does our interest lie? And at one point it lied in where the Republican Party was at. Uh, in another time period, it relied where the Democratic Party. And you had a, and you mentioned the Roosevelt era, black community split in the South where the Democratic Party, known as the Dixiecrats, were the administrators and perpetuators of segregation. Then black community to the degree it politically aligned was with the Republican Party. But meanwhile, in the North, because of the impact of Roosevelt and the more liberal uh, uh, context, Black people were shifting to the Democratic Party. So it's never been a party label as much as it's been, where can our interests best be addressed? And that has not been the Republican Party, at least going back to Ronald Reagan. Professor Lusain, uh, very briefly, uh, as a last comment, what are the implications of this uh, MAGA Black mo movement um, for the upcoming ele presidential elections in the United States? Would it make a difference? Uh, so this is a good question. So there's poll data, uh, including poll a poll that we did at Howard University, that definitely shows that there are there's a larger number of Black people than in previous elections who say they will vote for Donald Trump, anywhere from 15 to 25 percent, depending on the poll you're looking at. I tend to think that, you know, first of all, we're very far away from the election, but I also think that uh, there's evidence that people in the last minute change their minds and say, yeah, I really can't vote because vote for this guy, because that's what happened in 2020. Uh, but I think it does mean that uh, the Democrats have work to do, and they really have to get into these communities and make their case uh, both for why Joe Biden's agenda uh, is uh, uh, valuable to the Black community and the danger of ha having Trump become president again. Uh, I think this is particularly important for young people because Trump was president, you know, he was elected, you know, seven years ago. And if you're 18 or 19, that means Trump was elected when you were like 11 or 12. So you weren't paying attention. So for a lot of young people, you know, their president, uh, presidential experience is Joe Biden. And that's a mix because you got the war in Gaza, uh, which is horrific. And Biden's fingerprints are all over that war. And he hasn't uh, demonstrated his ability to uh, put pressure uh, or significant pressure on Netanyahu and people, young people are looking at that because that's one of the issues for their generation. And the MAGA folks are going to exploit all of that. Well, Dr. Lucien, thank you very much for sharing uh, this research that you're engaged in. I look forward to reading your book and we'll have you on Carp Nation again to continue this discussion about this new development politically in the black community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Paul.